So welcome back to the Wisdom Factory with, yeah, conversations that matter. These are conversations that matter, but actually it's also part of our serious conscious aging. And I'm Heidi Hörnlein from the wisdomfactory.net. And with my partner, uh, Mark Davenport, who died a year ago, we initiated a serious conscious aging. And in that series, we already invited two years ago our my present guest Anne Roberts to talk about her work. And the title of today is Active Wisdom. This I'm reading <laughs> an inquiry into elderhood. And I remember we talked a lot about the gifts grandparents can give to their surroundings in the last conversation. Before we go into our topic, I give over to you, Anne. And I ask you to introduce yourself. <laughs> so my name is Anne Roberts. I live in a small village just south of Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, I'm retired now from paid employment, but I spoke recently with someone. She says, I don't talk about retirement. I talk about refirement. Um, you know, so for me, it's about this time in my life where I'm not parenting. Um, I'm not having to earn a, an income a living and what do I do with my life now uh, into my elderhood and that's the inquiry that I'm on at the moment uh, with friends. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful when we are free of uh, needing to go out for work and doing something just to survive and that we finally can do what we want to do. I'm fortunate enough too to have a little pension with Mark Mark left me and I'm fortunate that America is giving me American pension. <laughs> so I don't have to, to go out again and find uh, work. And I'm very grateful and I can do this work, which is work too. <laughs> but it's not an, how, how did you say before, an income work or a... a Sorry, what did I say? I think I said income generating, you know, pay yes, something like that. Yeah. I mean, it would be nice to get income for that too, but you know, at the end we can survive yes. in that way. So you are collecting, you were collecting testimonies of older people and you were beginning to create a, a community around that. So I would invite you to first Talk, yeah, you said now we can do what we want to do. And you for yourself are trying to find what you do with your own life after mm -hmm. retirement. <laughs> Refirement, I like that. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> but there is some other uh, motivation and inspiration, I guess, for the work you are doing now. So uh, can you talk about that? In, in 2015, when I, I retired, um, I realized that I didn't quite know what to do with myself. Um, and so I went back to university and I did a master's in applied social science. But actually I realized that there was a level of discomfort in my life. You know, you would think when I'd retired, I would be really settled and happy and firing on all cylinders. But actually I felt kind of a bit lost. And so I went back to uni and I did a dissertation on grandparenting. And I was introduced to a book, and I brought it with me today, by Mary Catherine Bateson called Composing a Further Life. Um, and in it, she refined a model by Eric Erickson called the Life Cycle Model. And she was basically saying that um, because of healthy longevity, a new stage is emerging in Ericsson's model, which she was calling active wisdom. And when I read it, I thought, this is what I'm going through. It was like the scales fell from my eyes. Mm -hmm. I really understand now. And she talks about this transition from the world of parenting, if you choose to have children, the world of work, um, into this post-work parenting phase. It used to be you went into retirement and old age, but no, now there's this stage which is she calls active wisdom. And she says it's almost like an identity crisis similar to moving from adolescence to adulthood. And that spoke to me, Heidi, about this is what I'm going through. And it was just, and it didn't, it, 
it wasn't over quickly. That's the, the realization. It's been a number of years and I feel I'm coming out of it now and I want to share my own personal understanding and be in relationship with others around this stage because it's brand spanking you. Yeah, and Go we, ahead. Yeah, we know now from, from newspaper articles that uh, going into retirement, especially for men, is often the cause of pre premature, how do you say, premature death. So they, they don't find a new purpose in life when they cannot continue to work, which had been their purpose in life, obviously, up to that point, and then they feel lost. And then often, I think there are statistics around that two years, more or less, after not going to work anymore, many, many people get sick or die. So that's really purpose in life. Find purpose in life. And as far, so far, it seemed to be that work had given us the purpose of life. The earning, needing to earn money. And we, we don't need to earn money. We have to work <laughs> in a different way. So... Tell me a bit more about that, uh, how you overcame this. And the interesting thing was I also, in doing the research, came across a, came across a concept called the sandwich generation. And the sandwich generation is men and women who have aging parents and children, and they're sandwiched between those responsibilities. And that can be stressful. What I found myself in was what they then called the club sandwich generation. I had another layer. And again, because of healthy longevity, we're all living longer. So the number of generations alive at the same time are increasing. So I had, my, I had four aging frail parents in their late 80s and 90s. With David and I, we had four adult daughters. And then we had the arrival of grandchildren. And so the stretch of our caring support became uh, increased and I got ill, which was, was really interesting for me. And I got stressed. And that, I didn't think I really did stress. I thought I was actually a relatively resilient personality, if you, if you would call it that. And what I realized was I didn't really want to care for elderly parents. I wanted to be much more down my lineage to the grandchildren. Um, and the, the prospect that, I had, that we had to do was to clear family homes, sell family homes, um, support them into uh, appropriate accommodation, really broke my heart. Giving away my parents' generation's possessions broke my heart. So it wasn't just the time of moving from work into retirement it was also what my life was like and that's another aspect of elderhood that I really want us to talk about as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah I see it also with friends they are already almost in their 70s and still have to take care for for their parents <laughs> with the long long life we have now. Wow well, yeah. And so elderhood, which I think is a wonderful phrase, is where I'm working now. You know, the, the, baby, the baby boomer generation is sometimes, that was another thing I found, it's called the pig and the python generation. <laughs> what does that mean? So if you imagine a snake, a python, but uh -huh. a pig, mm -hmm. this bulge moves down the snake. <laughs> And, and that's what the baby boomer generation, this post-war generation, you know, it was a, a bulge in the 60s, it was a bulge in the 70s, the 80s, 90s, and so on. And it's had a profound impact on each decade that it's been in. And now it's in this time of elderhood, of aging. And it's a big population and it's resourced and it's resourceful. And it feels like me, it's a generation that could give a lot back. You know, so not everybody um, gets depressed or sad. There's a lot of people out there doing great work from this generation. And I'm really interested in finding out what's happening across the, the planet around this time of our generation. Mm -hmm. So you are creating community about that? You are inspiring people to connect with you and what, what is their present um, 
ideas how to do that. <laughs> well, um, so we act of wisdom is the stage that Mary Catherine Bateson spoke about. So I've created a LinkedIn group you know, to talk about uh, elderhood in this time of act of wisdom. Um, there's a Facebook group and we have an organisation called the Centre for Timeless Earth Wisdom. Because one of the things I've done since 1996 is I've trained in a body of earth wisdom. So that kind of underpins how I view the world. It's my worldview. And so there's a community of us who've trained in this particular approach as well that centre around uh, this organisation. And also we put together a programme, an inquiry into elderhood that we're just launching, which is a bit of fun as well. I'm going to have a drink. I've got a yeah. I'm also reaching out to uh, networks, um, learning what others are doing. And that's why I enjoyed the Conscious Aging uh, series that you did, because you brought so many interesting people, you know, about... Um, how to handle aging in a good way, how to respond well, um, how to see how others view you as you're getting old. You know, people get up and give me their seats on the bus now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they look at me as if, uh, you know, I, I was ill at the beginning of the year and was hospitalised and there was these young men and women who my care was in their hands. And I think they saw me as old. It was really interesting. Oh, yeah, old. <laughs> you know, when we were younger, 60 was, you know, far away. And now we are over 60 ourselves and think, oh, how did that happen? <laughs> and are we the role models for aging for those that are coming behind us? You know, it's like paving a path of, of wellness, of vigor and rigor you know that, that we can call forward into our 60s 70s and 80s I mean my dad was at, died at age 92 and he was still playing golf out in the garden you know with his swinging and you go out and there he's 90 he had his hand on a branch pulling himself up and down to make sure he was fit oh wow well, yeah that's good <laughs> yeah sometimes you know I, I, I have knee problems sometimes, you know, and or other things. Now, when Mark died, I was sort of going into depression. And so the body was also not very fit. And when I couldn't sit down or get up easily, and then it is very easy to buy into the old ideas. Oh, now you are old. And that's why you are old. And be quiet. And don't, you know... Uh, but when you are better off in your mind, then you realize, no, you are not old. You are, yeah, a certain age, but you still can do a lot of, and I even want to take off the still out of my sentence. You can do a lot of things and even with your body, you know. And I begin again now to do home biking and because I didn't go for bike anymore because there was nobody to go with. Now I started again, the knees get better and you know there are a lot of things we can do to keep our moods up and also our our systems up, you know, and not buy into this idea oh now you are old and this is the beginning of the end, you know. <laughs> That's a really interesting point because for me sometimes I encounter people who want to have this positive mental attitude you know that drives forward and oh you know i don't pay attention to aging and there's like a, a strictness that can come forward and for me that doesn't quite work i want a sense of realism for me around aging you know things do creak a bit and there is the potential for uh, discomfort and potential illness and I want to be alert to that but I don't want to be constrained or controlled by it the way you were speaking as well but I don't want to kid myself either and I find I want to find a balance a middle ground of acceptance and appreciation but determination and adventure as well and that's really important for me yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I wouldn't now jump uh, from a ladder anymore or something because I know <laughs> that doesn't work, you know. <laughs> but 
what I was saying is not to buy into this, what your inner voice says. They say, ah, you know, now it's beginning, now you're getting this, and then, then you will see you get this, and then you will uh, decline immediately, and so on. And when we believe in this inner voice in moments when you are not well off, yeah. then it's much more difficult to, to get out anymore. I sometimes say to the voice, really, I say, stop it, yeah. <laughs> quiet. <laughs> you know, it's not true. But I, I, I realize that we have to adapt to our age in the sense of the state of our bodies. When you always have been a sportive person, it's good that you are still, uh, still running and doing everything. When you have never been a sportive person, uh, we have to begin to, to do something, at least in a certain level. You know, we don't have to do Olympics anymore, but... but keep the body working. And now when we are sitting so much in front of the computer, then needs to be some, I did a long walk this morning. So, you know, a little bit we need to do, even if we would prefer when we are this type of person, there are different types of person, the movement type and the non-movement type. When we are the non-movement type and want to sit and, you know, we have then to have some sort of discipline because we know that uh, the body needs movement, you know, from our head. So, so the, the interesting thing in the program that we're launching, which is called Active Wisdom and Inquiry into My Elderhood, if I could go there now, it takes me right into the first aspect that we look into, which is my well-being. And mm -hmm. what we've been talking about is how do I care for myself to care for others? That's what I'm interested in, you know, so that you protect and sustain and maintain the physical part of our lives in a way that allows us to continue doing what we really want to do and and i think that's such an important part of aging and paying attention to my well-being and part of that is also being with others isn't it to be yeah. human and to have friends around and to be able to laugh and joke around what's happening to us as well yeah, that's more easy when you are with people, yeah. And uh, I was thinking for our generation and the previous generation of women, it is especially difficult because we were sort of educated to take care for others but neglect ourselves. And now it's the time where we really need to begin to care for ourselves because, and not my mother, for instance, she thought she cared for herself when she goes out and uh, buys some new clothing because before she never allowed herself to be sick, you know, but she didn't really care for herself. She wanted to sit only in her armchair and we try to make her do exercises and, you know, she did a little bit for us, but as soon as she was alone, she didn't. And she ended up like petrified in her, in her chair, you know, because she didn't understand that it is important. She herself is important in the world. Yeah. And when she has no children uh, anymore to, to care about or no husband, and then for her it was sort of the end, and she didn't make the transition to care for herself in a, in a good way, I mean, you know. What you're reminding me of as well as I listen is what, when I interviewed the grandparents for my dissertation, both the men and the women spoke about their parenting in a particular way and the demands and the way that they operated as parents. And then both the men and the women had made conscious choices to be different as grandparents. You know, for the women, it was to be less caring, you know, to be the grandmother who is outrageous and takes the children away and is playful with them, but doesn't have to do the meals necessarily. And for the grandfathers, many of them were away at work a lot and felt they missed out quite a lot on the the growth of their children, the upbringing of their children. And so they wanted to be much more close in and being a different kind of grandfather to father that they were. And I thought that was so interesting for how this time of life offers differences in the family as well. Mm -hmm. And did you find out that these people, when they had this mindset, that they also understood that they have to care for themselves, that they have to do some some exercise that they have to eat in a certain 
or drink less or something like this, you know? Did you find that? I didn't find that explicitly. Um, I mean, some of them weren't well, you know, they were working with health challenges. Um, what I did find was that they were seeing the opportunity that the space they had was giving them. Um, you know, one of my friends with his son set up a brewery, um, a microbrewery, and he's had an absolute ball. And it's just been like a second life for him. Um, I had another uh, one who was really into crafts with her grandchildren, the way that she hadn't had time to do as a mother, and was really teaching them all the, you know, how to knit, how to sew, how to do collages. Another one, you know, uh, was about nature. How am I going to get the children out into nature? So the beach. You know, the, the forest, teaching them about plants and trees, you know, so each of them, I, I felt, found something that they wanted to focus on with the grandchildren. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But their own personal well-being, I don't remember, if I'm really honest, that that was a focus of our conversation. Mm -hmm. So that would be the first uh, part of your course, the personal well-being of getting older, people getting older. Yeah, and taking... What, yeah, what else are the, the So point? we then go to what we call my development. And again, one of the challenges we laid down in the programme is, where are you now in your own learning and growth, your own personal development? You know, what are the opportunities and the challenges? What's kind of, what's your learning age? Um, and that sometimes it's a surprise for people to say at this time in my life, you know, personal development, absolutely. However, it comes forward for you, because that's the adventure, that's the stretch. Um, and this is also the inspiration, because I, I guess that most people think personal development, I'm adult, I'm even old. What are you talking about, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And it doesn't have to be academic. It's, it's more about what do I not know? And lots of people are, you know, with the internet, uh, one of the people I was talking to was genealogy, you know, really tracking down um, their family history uh, and learning how to do that on the computer. You know, for me, I'm currently uh, reading a book called The Cosmic Hologram by a scientist called Jude Caravan. And it's completely conceptually at my edge, but I, I just want to understand what it is that she's seeing and, and is writing about, you know. So we each find our way. I mean, David at the moment, he's gone to a toddler first aid because he wants to make sure if anything happens when we're watching the grandchildren, he knows what to do. Ah, <laughs> good, yeah. So it doesn't have to be big licks it just where's your edge of learning so uh, who comes into this mindset needs to be very curious yeah. and willing to open up even if they feel they are not yet open but with the help of inspiration and also tips I guess you also give tips or something yeah. then it's an inquiry. I think yeah. mm -hmm. for us, it's not that we have the answers. We have lots of questions, but we're really, I really want to be in a co-creative space with others who are at this stage and who are really curious about how do we make the most of it? How do we support each other? Um, and that's where I'm interested. And if I can just leap now, the, the third stage that we take people in is what's called my vocation. And I, I read a, a piece by Barbara Max Hubbard, if you've heard of her, who was a fascinating woman who um, spoke about vocational arousal. Yeah. Vocational arousal. And she said, yes, that sizzle of what you want to do with your life. And she was saying it only re ha really happens in the company of others. You have to be in community. So what is it you want to do in community with others, either in the group that we're forming or in other groups, but really getting that purpose clear or shared? 
you know, is is the the third part of what we want to do with people. Yeah. And, and conscious aging for me felt like you and Mark's vocational arousal, you know, the, the energy that you brought to it, the fun that you brought. Mm. Um, even two years ago, I watched the series and each person that you brought, you had a wonderful dance with. Do you remember that? Yeah, and absolutely. That was so precious. And that's vocational arousal in action for me, where mm. there's that lightness and that fun and that engagement. Yeah, that was mainly Mark's idea, you know. He was so fascinated by the idea that he could live 30 years when we met, uh, which actually he didn't. But anyway, the idea that there was all this time before him, and he was never really, never not, but in the last years of his profession, he was not satisfied at all with what he needed to do for surviving, and he went into pension as soon as he could. And then he somebody... I think his uh, son-in-law taught, taught him how to use the computer. And then he came across uh, Integral Ideas, Ken Wilber and other books. And then for him, the, the world opened up. And when we met, we were connected on this uh, topic. And then I, you know, like a good German, I said, we have to do this and we have to do this and blah, blah, blah. And I tried to do some videos, the first ones, you know, looking into the camera and that was really awkward. And he did a video about touch because he liked to touch, you know, and he discovered the physicality you know, in, in, in this period of his life, uh, physicality, which is not only sexuality, but uh, in different ways. He, I also took him to a meditative Pilates, which we were doing twice a week. So when he went in front of the camera, did his first video, I was so astonished. I thought, wow, he has such a gift, you know, and that was what, how it was born that we would do things together because he alone wouldn't have done it. Yeah. So I had to be the initiative and then he, he, he entered into this topic with conscious aging. Oh, if I have all this time, you know, what can we do out of it? How could it look like? While before, when he was in Florida in a retirement home where he couldn't even legally have a cat, he, he was sort of, you know, yeah, I have something in the internet to listen to, but it's not really, was not alive. And as soon as there was community with people, he really was on the same wavelengths, first in, on internet and then with me in person and we went to the conferences. He had a second life, that, that was it. And this is the vocational arousal. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he couldn't go along with it, but he had this time of finding out what he was able to do and have joy with it and, and what he was interested in and how he could contribute to, to others with that. And that's very beautiful. And that's, that just speaks to where I feel personally as well. I, I just feel I'm so enjoying what I'm doing. And with my co-creative buddy called Firehawk in the Center for Timeless Earth Wisdom, he's a techie genius. Yeah. And so he does all the techie stuff. And then he joins me for the delivery. And I feel as if I've got this wonderful partner who can share the holding of the space for others in terms of how we hold the program but also has this technical expertise that allows us to do online and i just feel that this vista has opened up for me of how to reach out you know way beyond a small village in scotland mm -hmm. and offer something that i think will make a difference and will enable myself to give back but also in in this community of others yeah, wonderful. That's exactly what yeah. we can do. The, the only um, thing that the people who join you need to have a rudimentary understanding of a computer. No? How yes. to get into... But normally it's only clicking a, 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 an, in, an address, no? And you come in, so... Well, the, the, the wonderful thing is the technology is moving so quickly now that is making it more and more easy to be online together. You know, just like this space that you and I are in Zoom. Mm -hmm. It's so easy now in comparison. I remember, you know, when we met two years ago, it, it was a bit more tricky to gather and hold it in a good way. Whereas now, and the we're using a, a 
of a platform called Kajabi and it does everything you need. It mm -hmm. provides a community space, it provides a space to hold all the materials, um, you can upload videos with these, you know, and all of a sudden it's, it's not it's not dead simple. I mean, Firehawk still got the technical bit to do, but it's all much more interrelated and you've got less of these plugins and widgets and things to do. Yes. Yeah. It is uh, still work for who is setting it up, but who is in the audience, it's much less uh, complicated, no? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's go on with, uh, with the course. The final, the final piece of the, uh, the wheel of active wisdom, as we call it, is my freedom. And that's the active wisdom piece. And it all culminates here about what Mary Catherine Bateson talks about. There's a virtue to active wisdom and a vulnerability, she said. And the virtue of this stage of our life, she calls engagement, the stage is active wisdom. And it's about really engaging in your life and stepping forward. The vulnerability of this stage she called withdrawal, where just as you said earlier, you know, you stop doing something and you step back and you're not sure how to step forward. And my freedom really looks at what is this time of our lives in terms of what I want to do for me that has a purpose and a meaning and leaves a legacy. And that was a really big thing she spoke about as well as people at our stage start considering our legacy. A legacy may be a, a downer lineage, you know, as you look at your children, if you've chosen to have them and your grandchildren and up your legacy from your ancestors and, and where you live. I was at a program recently where I was asked to consider what was the gift of my mother's line the maternal line and what was the gift of my father's line what was the gift of the country i was born into and i found that so energizing you know just one thing for me was the music of scotland is something i so appreciate there's a real depth and breadth of music here that reflects the land you know so that's the final piece we look at um, and all of it is done in community, with a community space where we can talk to each other about what's being revealed. And I really appreciate you listening, Heidi. Thank you. Now, you know, it's, it's very interesting to me because I'm getting into adulthood too. And like you, I'm in a country, countryside where I don't have much connection and where I need to find the connection via internet and I fortunately do find that and interesting people and to talk to and you know that's still still or again a topic I'm interested in and I would love if we could in some way collaborate in the future on on, on the elderhood <laughs> topic. I would love that uh, yeah. you know to just to bring people together to talk about it and to see that we're not alone yeah. in this time of our lives and it isn't a time of necessarily downhill you know? and I think what you were saying about exercise as well is about how are we striding uphill to build our wellness to build our fitness in the spiritual the physical the emotional and the mental realms you know and there the mutual support is so important the inspiration and also other people holding you accountable for for what you are doing when you are alone you say ah, yeah maybe tomorrow and tomorrow you say ah maybe next week but if there another person says come on do it it's good for us for two, for you first of all and then for us and afterwards when you have done your exercise we can go and have a beer somewhere you know <laughs> like that. sometimes we need this sort of encouragement you know and then you as soon in my experience as soon as you have to go uh, overcome the what we, in German, we call the inner swine dog, the inner Schweinehund. I don't know how you say it in English. The one who wants to, uh, yeah, no. I, no. As soon as you have overcome that and you do the activity, physical activity, the body is happy and you, your mood goes up. That's really an, an experience. But the first, the first hurdle 
needs to be overcome. And there, other people are really, really, really helpful too. But if you do it all alone, uh, <laughs> I love learning about what others are seeing. You know, they, they bring new perspectives in, things I hadn't thought of. You know, I, I mean, I, we are going through quite a challenge in the UK at the moment around what's happening in relation to, to Europe. And I don't want to get worried by that. And I find that when I talk with others who have different perspectives about the arc of history, for instance, you know, and um, it, it changes the worry into a consideration that's maybe more balanced, more inclusive, more insightful, you know. So I find others' viewpoints really healthy and helpful in where I am now in my life as well. You you mentioned before the magic word co-creation. Yes. And I find this really the thing I, I sometimes have discussions with people like yesterday evening where the discussions become fights yes. and that's not you know uh, that's not really good and normally you say when you get older your mind gets closed and you 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 know what you know and then you fight for it because you know it better but it must not be so when we keep our open-mindedness or even come to it some people only in older age for experience come to a op more open mindset then things open up no? and well, the creation so interesting for me because that's the power of questions what i find is when i'm with people who make lots of statements you know they assert a position then you have to either be in agreement, disagreement, you know. So the co-creative space for me is about questioning. It's about the power of questions. And in, in the program that we run, it's all about evocative questions, not about statements of it's this, it's that, either or, you know, characterizing things. It's much more about what are the nuances and the subtleties here? And when you get into a co-creative space, there has to be some rules or agreements around what that space is like. So that when we do step out of that and it begins to get uncomfortable or polarized, you can say, well, let's come back to the purpose here. So co-creation is not always easy. It's not a free for all at all for me. It's about clear agreement, using questions and being open to not knowing, being open to new perspectives. So it's a really good question about that space. And it tests us sometimes when we're used to leading, where we say we're going this way and people follow. The co-creative space is, shall we go this way? And if not, why not? Mm -hmm. And I have found out that I have several groups, especially women groups in German and also in English, where we are in this co-creative space. And what uh, is for me is fundamental is the listening capacity. Yes. Listening really in what the other person has to say and not already uh, as default position thinking, oh, no, later I will t say that. But just listening to the end and then wait what will arise and then you speak. But not have your response right away, you know. So, but you might during when the other person speaks in yourself might be a, a change of, of, of your, I don't want to say perception, but of your perspective maybe mm -hmm. and then what you say afterwards when you allow the space it comes out something different than when you from the beginning say oh, I have to say that and that that's not right well, something like this you know and what I, have you ever been in that that situation where you're in a co-creative space and the sizzle happens you know something happens where you all feel happy. You all feel that something interesting has happened and you're not quite sure how it happened, but you all feel great and you go, ah, right. And then something emerges, either a new idea or fun or opportunities or possibilities. And that's the vocational arousal piece, you know, for me, when all of a sudden you all go, wow, what happened there? 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it happens, and what I find that regularly happens after the, the meeting, most people say that was so inspiring for me, so nurturing for me. So this way of being together, an hour and a half, flies away, yes. really. And, and you, you feel like, you know, even if you came in like tired and you come out and are uh, like this. And this is for me the, the gift of the co-creation of being in the moment, attentive to what is going on in yourself, in the speaker and in the whole group. So that's the, the, the field which we are creating together. And we can become sensitive to that. Yes. And you are also very sensitive if somebody is sort of disrupting the field. And then we need to have guidelines in place to, to make sure that it isn't destroyed. Because sometimes one person is enough to destroy for everybody else this wonderful experience. And yeah, that sounds so good, really. And it's an experience for everybody, even if they have never been in a space like that. But if you just, the first few times, I had women in the women's group. I have every week now a German-speaking women's group, and we just meet. Sometimes uh, one, some people, then they change, you know. They are not all the time every week. But um, when a new one comes, like lately it was, she said, I gave her, I said, I hadn't heard from you. From you. Do you want to contribute something? And she said, I first want to listen. I first want to, to, to experience the, the atmosphere, experience the field, and then I will also contribute, you know? So that's a good way of entering into, into groups, to, to listen, that's right. to feel. <laughs> Wonderful. And to enjoy yourself, you know, and, and to, you know, sometimes it's about trusting yourself to speak as well. You know, um, my view is worthwhile and um, not to hold back being fully who I am in that space. That's something for me sometimes is, um, can I be fully who I am? Because, you know, I'm, I can be quite talkative sometimes, you know, so finding that balance of not holding back, but not being too forward as well is the challenge I find sometimes for me. Mm -hmm. And somebody will have the challenge, as you said, can I speak? Is it important what I say? And when you as uh, the group give the, um, the safe space, let's say safe space, today it's a fashion word, but I mean the space where you and your contribution is welcome, even if I don't think like you do think, because you know in this space that the others are not judging you. And they don't have immediately, you are wrong, you know, but just say, oh, you see it this way. Ah, interesting, you know. And when you have this space, then you, you can speak and you will feel comfortable to speak there. That's my experience anyway. So, hmm. In the Earth Wisdom tradition that I've trained in, we have a protocol called the stringing of the beads. And it's a way of hearing all the voices in a circle. And when one person's speaking, speaking what we call their bead, everyone else is listening. And they continue to speak until they're complete. And then they say, I have spoken. And the rest of the group say, ho, oh, acknowledging that their words have been heard. And I have to say that that sets a ground for the rest of the gathering where we've connected the circle, we've strung the beads, each person's spoken, they've been listened to. And by the time we've completed that circle of sharing, maybe present condition, how am I today? Um, the energy in the circle has started to coalesce into that safe container that you speak. Mm -hmm. I can speak and I can be heard. And there's a protocol to hold it. So it's, you know, because often I find I'll go online into a group that I'm new to and there's no protocol for connecting us online. Mm -hmm. And I find that in the online space, it's even more important to have protocols when you're not in physical connection. It's harder to um, feel the energy of the space you're in as well. Despite, I think, with video, uh, it's much easier. 
written spaces on Facebook or something, it's much more difficult to feel a connection. But when we look at each other, it's, it's almost like in person. That's my experience, you know, because you can see my, my face and my body movements. I can see yours. So that's already quite a lot of information we share with each other. And so we, we can be much more comfortable in knowing that we are, how can I say, accepted or that we are in a part of this field we are creating in, in a good way. So that leads me to the question. So you, in this course you will be doing, you do, let's say, real work, but you also uh, create the space for, 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 for the people, this felt space to, to be together, to have a possibility to, to feel together, let's say, <laughs> in some way. Yeah. So we have a two-hour call, six two-hour calls across a 12-week period, uh, which sets the ground for, you know, we begin, we do the four aspects, and then we complete. Um, and we do dyad and triad work together when we're together on the call. We do large group work. And each time we have uh, evocative questions throughout the two hours that open up the space of the particular focus. So we have one around my well-being or my development. And we then have what we call a live with. So we say the two weeks in between the calls, here's something to live with around your elderhood that you can take into the context of your life. And then we have guides on the program who hold groups in between. And we have a community space where we can type, you know, share our ideas and it's a confidential safe space. And we can form little groups or triads in the community space for interests, you know, if there's people that are interested in grandparenting, well, let's have a group on that. If there's people interested in a particular project, you know, let's have a, a group on that. So it's this inquiry. It's not a developmental program per se. It's much more about let's look into um, how this works now for us and see how it en enables us, emboldens us um, to do even more with the energy and the skills and the mm -hmm. life experience that we have. Mm -hmm. So lately, sort of developmental courses were held uh, live and then later only um, the replay, you got the replay, you paid the courses, got the replay and then, you know, there was not much more around. So what I'm hearing you say that it is always life, that there are people are always, that you are always together with the people in this course, that the people can talk in this course. That's not only that you talk to the people like a lecture and, uh, and they are listening, but they, they have a real uh, possibility to participate and co-create the course in, in, in some way. It's all about relationship for me. It's not about imparting information. It's about inquesting. It's about these questions and how we as a generation can be in relationship in, in a different way. Absolutely. And so, thank you, you put the nail on the head. It's about relationship for me and how I can learn through relationship with others and how they can learn from what I've experienced going through this act of wisdom transition that I've been in, yeah. That is a wonderful way of exchange experience, at least in our group. But I find today with, uh, when, with younger people that they are often not interested in what I know. <laughs> that uh, uh, they don't ask and, and, and reinvent the wheel, you know. So I have given up to to, to tell them what, <laughs> what I could tell them, you know. But maybe in, we are more open in our age group to do that, to learn from each other. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I've found is, again, I like to ask young people questions and, and see what I get. And sometimes they'll engage with me and sometimes they won't, you know, that they'll be a bit bemused by the fact that I'm actually interested in um, what they 
they have to say, you know, my grandchildren are quite young at the moment and I'm looking forward to when they're a bit older and I can have even more. But they teach you so much, you know, as well. So I think it's, for me, it's about can I listen first and and see if there's a energetic, exchange with the young person yeah in the in the case of young children i think you have a good chance to by listening to engage them i'm talking more about those 30 year old 40 year olds they have all invented their own reality and their own beliefs and they think they know everything better you know <laughs> no. When I look back to myself in my 20s and 30s, oh gosh, I thought I knew. <laughs> yeah. And we, that's the nice thing of our age. We come to appreciate the saying which says, I know that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, what I heard as a, as a feedback for what I'm doing with the interviews, is somebody said, you know, it's great that you don't have to pretend that you that you know things. You just can say, uh, I don't know it. And I said, that was a learning curve to be able to say that instead of needing to be perfect and needing to know everything and trying to pretend you know something which you don't know. And I think that has to do also with getting older that we realize we don't, we don't need to be all, how do you say, all knowing or uh, omni, omni knowing. I don't know the the word in English. You're just taking me into where I was when I was ill with the, the young doctors and nurses. You know, I had to put myself into their hands to get well. I was seriously ill. And it was scary to surrender, to surrender to that expertise. And yeah, so I get that. I get exactly what you're saying. And sometimes you need to surrender. <laughs> and also sometimes I also have a lot of life experience so finding that balance so I didn't want to surrender in a way that didn't ask the right questions you know why am I having this injection do I really need to have it do I really need to put this into my body and you could see them saying well yes and I would say but why and they wouldn't have an answer and so they'd have to go off and you know so not yeah so there's that, I get, you know, for me, it's always about what's the, what's the middle ground here of these opposites that I can move forward with. Isn't that our wisdom is about having an ability to take information and then make your own choices with it and be able to say, I don't know, but not to give away my own knowing as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know doesn't mean anymore more. Um, I don't know, but it means I'm not exactly sure that <laughs> what I know is the right thing, you know? So you open more possibilities. And so you also open your, to, for your own mind to inquire into more things and get a broader perspective of knowing, but you don't know black and white, you know, anymore. You don't need to, to pretend that you are the know, know it all. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That, I would say, in my opinion, is healthy adulthood yeah. to get into this place and allow other perspectives, other opinions without getting angry. But maybe find, if you really think it's not right or it's not good, let's say right is not a good word. I would say it's not good in, in the face of what is intended with this action also. You know, when, for instance, uh, when I want to go to Rome here, go out of the street and go left instead of right, I would have to go around, you know, <laughs> the whole island. So in this sense, right and wrong, you know, but you sure can go the other way around if you want to. So if it is, how can you say useful more than, than right or wrong? Yes. So what would, <laughs> I don't know where I started off. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, you have the ability to, to say it, it's no absolute truth anymore. It's a relative truth, and I'm aware of that, and I don't have to insist that I know it better. Yes. But if I understand that somebody is going in a 
direction which is not good for them, which has, is dangerous, you might find a way to to convey it without saying, you have to do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the challenge for us, to find the language, the appropriate language to communicate what we know, if it is helpful to the others. Yeah. Wow, we, we have talked almost an hour. That, that was great. I feel, you know, what we did is a co-creative conversation. Yeah. I feel energized. I feel happy. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. And I just want to speak my appreciation of you giving me the opportunity to be part of the series. You know, I got lots of lovely feedback first time round. <laughs> and it, it's lovely to be out in the world sharing and doing and feeling that there's possibilities for new adventures. So I'm really looking forward to uh, the next round. You know, we, we, we'll have a conversation about perhaps a group that might come together to talk yeah. about really up for that. Yeah, yeah, we will organize that for sure. Uh, now, for this course you are doing, can you give information? Because if somebody is interested to go into this beautiful experience of a community of co-creation, uh, they need to know where to go. Right. Um, I don't have it to hand at the moment, but the website is called Act of Wisdom and Inquiry into My Elderhood. And the, the, the address is maybe active wisdom. Do you have it? Uh, yeah, I will post it uh, in the in the video, uh, so it's fine. But I'm quite sure when you Google it, Papa Google or Mama Google, whoever it is, they will find the the right with your name and Roberts. They will find it. Yes, and my email address is Anne at conscious dot me dot uk. If people want to email me, and it's Anne without an e. Okay, good. So. They will find you, and we hope that we come together to this course. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Thank you very much.